Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the semifinals, day number one of the Magnus Carlsen Invitational. As part of the Champions Chess Tour, we've got Magnus Carlsen taking on Jan Nepomnici, and on the other side of the bracket, we have Anish Giri and we have Wesley So. I've got good news and bad news. I'm going to start with the bad news first. I've got a nose pimple, so please disregard it. And the good news is that I washed all of my hoodies recently, so they are restocked and ready to go. And so are these Grandmasters. We're going to kick things off with the matchup between Wesley So and Anish Giri. As always, timestamps are on the video player. Feel free to jump around or don't. Why are you skipping anything? These recaps are great. And this is game number one. Anish goes for e4, e5, obviously. And with that, we'll go to game number two. No, just kidding. Knight f3, knight c6. We have the Rui Lopez. Or no, wait. People were saying Rui Lopez. There we go. Rui Lopez. I saw some of the uh, some of the comments about the Spanish language because I know you guys know that I like to uh, pronounce things the right way. So we got a Berlin invitation, and this is something known as the anti-Berlin, right? And now white takes on c6 and castles. And basically the position that you get early on, you might say, why on earth would Wesley do this? Well, you're trying to defend your pawn, and when black castles, white is trying to expand in the center with d4. Oh my god, how did I know that? So now bishop d6. Because if Wesley just takes, then Anish gets everything he wants, and Wesley doesn't get anything of what he wants. And life is all about trade-offs. So bishop g5, f6, bishop h4, you would say, why would Anish do that if he just has to move again? Well, now he has an active bishop, and these pawns are kind of, you know, awkward. And he's keeping the tension, is what this is called. He's keeping the tension. He doesn't want to take and improve Wesley's structure. So knight d2, queen f7, bishop g3, and Wesley so finally decides to make this trade after he has... Transf transferred his queen to cover all of these light squares and the rook pressures the pawn he finally opens things up so we get cd4 now he takes the bishop hg3 and knight to b6 at this point the players are more or less completely out of known territory uh, they are off on their own floating in orbit in outer space if you will <laughs> get it because the tournament is right so rookie one h6 and rookie three anish giri is trying to play tetris with his rook in reality, he's trying to double up in the future. So we get this, and uh, how did I know? But Wesley says, listen, you could do it, I could do it too. So it looks like the battle is going to take place right here down the middle of the board. Queen c3, eyes this pawn, and we get queen h5. It shows you that the board is a big place, right? Now you can't take because you would be trading a queen for a pawn, and that, well, is just not very good. Welcome to Gotham Chess Recaps. <laughs> I know y'all been missing that. So we get knight to h2, bishop b6, wait a minute, wait, 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 what is this move? I thought, yeah, Wesley says, I know, it's all good, it's all good, bishop f7. I'm sacrificing a pawn and I'm doing it because I am now activating all of my pieces and white's pieces are poorly coordinated, so we get pawn takes and now a big decision here, does Anish trade the queens, queen c3, now it's Anish Giri we're talking about, right? So obviously Anish trade it, wait a second, I, I mean... I thought Anish would go snap, snap, and maybe pawn up. Or, you know, bring the knight around to g3. Anish Giri says, out with the old, in with the new Giri. We're not trading queens. We're going to keep the queens on the board. We're going to keep fighting. But now Wesley plays this cool move g3. What g3 does is it opens up two attacks. You sacrifice this pawn, and you lose the f4 pawn. Now we get knight f5. And, wait, 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 wait. That knight used to guard the e pawn. So rookie four. It wasn't clear here what Anish missed. I remember I was watching uh, the Hikaru and Anna commentary I actually took today off. Uh, I was, I'm just getting some sleep. I haven't been sleeping too much. So I took the day off and I was watching the commentary. Hikaru couldn't understand what was missed here. Maybe he thought like D5 maybe. Anish thought he had D5, but then Queen F5. So Anish clearly misses something <clears throat> and doesn't just miss something. Then he just goes all in here with this move. Knight takes H6. Now listen, Anish Giri is a very strong player. He did not just take a pawn that is guarded by two different things and lose a knight for it and miss that. He didn't He did not see that it was guarded. I think what Anish thought here was that after gh6, maybe he has this, this, and queen f3 check, hitting this. But then there's a block. So Wesley just took the knight, and Anish resigned. And with that, Wesley so took a 1-0 lead. And it was really weird. It was really weird. No, I, I was like, wait a minute, what? And they drew the next game. So now it's 1.5, 0.5 for Mr. Uh, Wesley So. It was a very, very strange game, right? I mean, it was like a complicated fight, and then all of a sudden, boom! One guy has a knight and a bishop, the other guy has a knight. Being up a bishop is good. 
but not if you're a niche in this case. So with that, we move to game number three, and you're gonna say, well, Levy, this looks awfully familiar. I'm getting a little bit of deja vu. And I think it's because Anish was basically like, all right, I did my homework, I'm gonna go for the same stuff. And then Wesley played A5. You say, I don't, I don't see the difference. Well, in the other game he castled, and that's following known territory. Hundreds of games have been played in that line. But I think Wesley's logic was, okay, Anish has about an hour to prepare for me. He's gonna come up with something, so I'm gonna change it up. And he just, you know, pushes his A pawn. Just clamps down on the queen side, and at this point, they reach the position that's never been reached before. Whereas if a couple moves ago, Wesley had just continued like he did in the last game, they would have still been in that known territory. So Wesley so changes it up, and you'd say, why would he do that? He won that last game. He didn't win as a result of the opening. And when you know your opponent has an hour to prepare, you might as well surprise them. So we get knight d2, takes, takes, and now knight b6. So kind of a, a, a similar looking position, like finally we have castles, but this pawn's not on f6, the queen's not on that square, the bishop hasn't come out yet. Well, now with the, oh, well, you'd see the queen's not going there. It's a bit of a different position. So in each place, h3, bishop h5, and queen d3. Queen to d7. Now it's time to kind of, you know, maybe get our rook into the game, maybe activate the knight somehow, or it's time to push pawns in front of our king. Bishop goes back to g6 and knight to e3. Optically speaking, when you look at this position, it's like, wow, Anish has all this space and these central pawns. But the problem is they look nice, but they can't move. They look nice, but they can't move. It's like you have a nice car in your garage, but it has no wheels on it. The hell are you going to do with that car? Are you going to show your friends I have a car? Okay, drive it. Uh, I can't. It doesn't have any wheels. Oh. Well, that, I mean, does a car without wheels even count as a car? Or is it just a giant piece of metal? I'll let you discuss the... Uh, you know, philosophy there, but we get knight to d5. And that shows you that white can't really move forward because white is pinned. And then Wesley plops his knight into f4. This just looks, this just doesn't look very pleasant if you're a niche Giri, right? Now we get bishop f5, gf5, and g6. And Wesley's gonna transfer his queen and actually start some sort of attack. Maybe even king h8, rook g8. So in each place, bishop g3, knight back to h5, takes on g6, and h takes g6. Now here, Wesley could have taken the bishop and then went for a position like this. That was apparently some way for him to get an advantage, according to Mr. Beep Beep Boop. Um, HG6, Queen G2, King H7, and Rook D1. So Anish has all his pieces in the game. Now we get Rook E8. We get A3. I'm just waiting for this move E5 to happen. It's going to happen at some point. Has to happen at some point. It's going to happen at some point. Oh, there it is. Because this is the only way for Anish to make any forward progress in the position. Both players' kings are safe, but Black's king, surprisingly is less safe. And you say, how is that? Well, I'm kind of threatening to, you know, chip in and maybe open up the E and F files. So we get queen D7, rook E4. Why rook E4? Two ideas. Number one, he just really likes to move his rooks up, first of all. But really, you're trying to double up, but you're also trying to rook lift. I mean, you never know when that soft spot near the king, only guarded by the king, is going to fall over. And then Wesley blunders, pawn takes F6 check. So Wesley attacked the rook, right? But Anish has seen my video called, uh, you know, these two words will change your chess, uh, will improve your chess. And he knows what's worth more than a rook? You. He knows that you are worth more than a rook. Never stop believing in yourself. But he also knows that a king is worth more than a rook. So he hits the king, forcing this because the rook needs a guard, and then he plays rook e5. Now, the most impressive move of this whole position, obviously, the only move to keep advantage, is rook e5. You say, that looks like a mouse slip. I mean, why wouldn't he just bait the king into the middle? because you trade your most powerful attacking piece. The difference between these guys and us is that they can keep this tension and advantageously change the position. If rook takes, pawn takes, it's check and the queen is lost. So the rook cannot be taken, so the queen has to move. And now we play rook g5 and transfer the rook over and pressure this pawn. Nietzsche actually had a faster knockout. He could have maybe, you know, stacked on the e-file or played knight h4 targeting. But slowly but surely, he brings all the pieces over. He gets knight f5, forcing the sacrifice rook for knight. It was still a little bit tricky here. Wesley had some pressure. Uh, but finally, Anish Giri infiltrates, gives a check, king g5, and here finds the only move. Wesley is one move away from actually counterattacking here. But Wesley plays, uh, Anish plays rook g2. This knight is now pinned. It cannot move. Wesley thinks for a while here and ends up playing rook to e3, which is a blunder after the very simple rook f7. And it's, it's a blunder because after this queen trade, the knight is paralyzed. And after this, there's this beautiful move, rook f1. And rook f1 is winning 
uh, because the queen cannot take it because the knight is still pinned. And after this, there's just this, and uh, it's mate very soon with this kind of box. Now, it's kind of funny. Uh, Anish Giri uh, missed uh, mate in three. Yeah. Rook takes g3. Rook takes g3. Queen e7, and rook h7 mate. But, you know, he won the game. And um, sometimes it's, uh, it's better not to find mate in three. It's better to play out a few more moves, uh, you know, just for the love of the game. I'm sure he saw it. He just, you know, he wanted to play a few more moves. So when he strikes back... And it's one and a half a piece, which means that for the last game, well, Anisha has black, Wesley's got white. Now, you know me. I'm going to spoil something for you right now. Someone won this game. You say, Levy, why would you say that? Well, why else would I show a game? I mean, right? Let's be serious. So I'm not just going to tell you that uh, it was a, you know, it was a draw and the match is tied and blah, blah, blah. No, someone, someone won this game. Let's see who it was. D4, knight of six. We get a Grunfeld defense from Anish Giri. Bishop f4 and, and, and e3. So Wesley plays this. Uh, this is one of the lines, bishop f4. You say, Levy, that's a London. No, not everything is a London, okay? And, and you, know what else, you know what else I've heard beginners say? Levy, this is a reverse London. I don't know why you sound like Peppa Pig in my, ma in my made-up voice. Stop it. Not everything with a pawn out and a bishop out is a London. Stop. Knock it off. So we get rook c1, bishop e6. How what, what is that? It's a line, obviously. And now the bishop moves again, duh, because, you know, we teach beginners not to make uh, two moves with the same piece in the opening until you've developed all your pieces, but these guys make their own rules. b6 trying to break on the queen side, knight a4 trying to hold the queen side down, and Anish Giri says, you ain't gonna hold me down. What's worth as much as a bishop? A bishop. So we get e5. And we get a tactical slugfest. We get pawn, we get bishop takes, knight takes bishop, pawn takes knight. Now we got this bishop hanging. Where do you move the bishop? Of course, all the way back. Duh. And next, Anish is going to uncastle, play bishop f8, bring back all his pawns, right? And uh, set up for the next game. So f4 guards the pawn. We get f6. Another good move, trying to create oh, a break here in the center because Wesley hasn't castled yet. Pawn takes. Oh, now he castles. And now we get queen e7. And by the way, you notice how this has been here for a while? Keeping the tension. Don't just take stuff because you can. Because they just improve their position. You kind of like the fact that nothing has happened here because otherwise, you know, everybody... Nobody wants to give the other guys somewhere to move, right? So queen e7, queen d2, rook e8, rook f3. There's a big fight for this square. Now we get bishop g4 back. So the bishop goes... Bip, bip, bishop has an interesting life. It's like a slingshot. Now rook g3 and the bishop's gone. Sad, knight d7, b4, knight f6. So look at this position for Wesley. You know, under traditional rules of the game, if you don't have a dark squared bishop, you want to put as many pawns on dark squares as you can. And you have a light squared bishop, right? Because then you cover the dark squares and your light squared bishop can maneuver. But this is a weird position which kind of breaks the rules because by putting all the pawns on the dark squares, you've kind of given yourself a lot of targets. You're a little bit overextended. This square is weak. This is weak. And after knight f6, knight c3, there was a trade, and this, and, you know, it was a big moment here for Wesley. Like, Anish is threatening to take this pawn, Anish is maybe threatening to jump into the middle and activate his bishop, and Wesley thought for a while here and played this move f5. And Anish just took it, because he was like, what? And afterward, Anish said f5 is just a terrible move, literally. Like, in the interview, he was like, f5 is just a terrible move. So, f5, he called it a bit of a panic move, and actually, he could have played bishop h6, could have completely allowed this because bishop e3 is so strong. So Anish had a win on the spot. And, you know, bishop h6, if you try to guard, well, then I just crash on through and I have knight e4 as well. Knight e4 is actually just better than d4 completely. And I should probably think before I speak. Knight e4 wins material and crashes through the position. So he took and Wesley played here. And Anish jumped in and just moved this pawn out of the way. So that pawn just traveled like that. And now we have this nice solid blockade. Black is just um, doing very well here. There's not much to say. Bishop comes out to g4. Rook tries to trade on f8. Bishop goes to f5. Anish says, I like to move my rooks up two squares. Gotham said that earlier, so I'm going to show the fans that I do like to do that to double my rooks. And in doing that, all of a sudden, the, the there's just a... Wait, what? There's a pin. You're just stuck. So you got to be a little bit careful here, because if you just take, you lose... 
you lose because your queen is guarding mate. So you can't just go taking. Anish needs to set it up. So first, he moves the king out of the way, and then he moves the bishop out of the way. Now there's no king, and there's no bishop to take. So there's no pin, and there's nothing to take with mate. This bishop is completely paralyzed, so we get this move, and we just get queen e5. Rook f1, and takes. Takes, takes. And Wesley resigns. Because if rook takes, check and mate, because you're cut off. What? Anish Giri just storms back from being down 1 0, wins with white, and then wins with black. And now has a 1 0 lead over Wesley So. What? Ha. That was crazy. You know, if you ask any of the grandmasters in this field who they would prefer to play, or who they would hate to play the most if they were losing, it would probably be Wesley So. Because Wesley So is so solid. No pun intended. Now, we will move to the next match between the Triple Crown World Champion, Magnus Carlsen, and Jan Nipomnici, who's coming off a, a knockout of, um, of a one Hikaru Nakamura. Now, the first two games of this match were drawn in very different ways. The first game was 100 moves. And you say, Levy, that sounds like an epic game. Show it. Nah, it was... It's a typical super GM, you know, kind of like positional grind, blah, 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 blah. It's not as interesting as it sounds. The next game was 20 moves. Literally, it was pop, 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 draw. Okay, so that means the score is one to one, which means it's game number three. Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces goes for D4. Now, so far, so good, but already on the second move, we have a surprise. Now, Jan Nepomnich, he's a fantastic world-class player. He knows everything. He knows all the openings, but this is not normally what he plays. It's interesting because normally he plays the Grunfeld and I think he made a conscious decision in the first two games of this match when he had black to enter this. This is known as the Vienna variation, but not the Vienna variation that you might know with e4 and knight c3 on the first two moves. This is another version of the Vienna. And here, basically, white says, okay, well, you've taken my pawn, so let's, you know, let me go win this back. This is exactly how game number one went, that 100 move draw. b5, this is a new way of playing this position where you've been sacrificed this pawn, but win back the center pawn. In that first game, we got knight b5 and queen a4. Not very popular, and now Magnus did his homework. I mean, he knows the line, he just chose a different way to play. And we got knight b6 guarding c4. And here we got this modern approach of playing queen d2. This is a very unique way to play this position, and basically rook d1, queen f4 happens. I think one of the first people to do this was Ding Li Ren, the Chinese superstar, over uh, Jan Krzysztof Duda in the Olympiad in 2018, and he showed that that is a very interesting way to play for white when black castles. Except the way chess works is people start going into the position going, I don't have to castle. And this way to play the position, and castle long, is a new way to play this position. And that's the beautiful thing about chess and why it continues to evolve. And this is the first new move of this entire game, rookie one. And now Jan castles long and plays f5, takes, takes. A super complicated and messy position. Material is equal. The play has been castled on opposite sides. Now, this is a perfect rapid repertoire because you have like 10 minutes to find all the right moves at this point. In a classical game of 90 minutes, maybe you can find it. Computer seems to think that white is much better here, but let's see what Magnus can come up with. Queen e2 and bishop d2. So he's trying to develop his pieces on the queen side. Rook to g8, very clearly attacking the king. Bishop d6, aligning another piece this way. Magnus plays g3, and now Nepo plays the move f5 inviting a capture and giving away this powerful knight. Magnus says, sure, and cd6. Because if you had played queen d6, then I would have planted my knight here and played bishop g2 and black would have resigned. Maybe not that fast, but that would have been the plan. Bishop g2 anyway, rook e8, solidifying the only weakness that you have. And we get knight to h4. But Jan says, wait a minute, bro, that's weak. What are you going to do about that pawn? Magnus says, all right, I don't really like this, but I got to play this ugly rook move. And then I got to play bishop c3. And the point is that if you take me, I take you and you open up my rook. Now, of course, Jan Nepomnici didn't do that. He played knight f4, which is a lot cooler of a move because he just loses his knight, but opens up the rook. So first he plays this move. He doesn't take anything. He just literally sacked his knight to temporarily open the g-file and attack this and double up. Magnus Carlsen plays h3 and gives back the knight and plays bishop b7. His idea, I want to bail out. I want to bail out. 
okay? Let's just simplify the position down. I don't want to have any more attack, and I'm going to play the move d5. Wait, but what about knight takes? Rook e6, Magnus plays. Here. Here. All right, someone's about to get mated. I mean, one guy is, is checking the other, and this, okay, no more checks. But there's a move here that holds everything. The other guy's trying to go queen c6, queen a5. But Jan just plays queen b5. And I guess Magnus missed queen b5. I'm, I'm really, I don't know. Um, because the thing is, if he doesn't play d5, if he doesn't play this move, then Jan is going to play knight d5 anyway. So for example, king h2, knight d5, and it's, I mean, maybe you can go for this idea as long as this move is not a check. You see the difference? It's not a check. The problem is that since the move comes with check in the original position, it gives white the opportunity to get away. And now black uh, just consolidates. So we get this, 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 but Magnus is just down in exchange. He's just down rook for bishop. Jan continues to attack, presses forward, solidifies, pushes his pawns, hides his king, keeps on pushing, rook e2, and Magnus Carlsen resigns. Holy crap. What? The world champion just lost with the white pieces. It's 2-1 Nepo. Which brings me... To the final round of the day. Magnus Carlsen has the black pieces. He has to win to tie the match. E4, of course, you go for the Sicilian defense. I mean, Karo Khan wouldn't have been bad either, but Magnus, the Sicilian player, trying to get a knight orf. Jan says, uh-uh, we're not getting a knight orf. We're going to get this kind of weird uh, anti-Sicilian Bishop B5 Moscow variation where I try to keep the position closed. And you say, well, what is with these super GMs and undeveloping their pieces? And I'm going to say, just because they can do it doesn't mean you have to, okay? So B6, and now is really the weirdest moment of the game. The theory in this position, normally black goes E6 and waits to see if white will play D4. And what happens after that is this kind of setup for black is known as the, it's like called the hedgehog setup where all the pawns are on the sixth rank and it's a very complex position leading to some serious battles. But Magnus goes knight e5. And you would think, well, why would he double his own pawns? Well, it's not so bad. I mean, he opens up the file. It's, you know, this pawn's not going to really be taken by anything. It's going to be well protected. Um, but Nepo doesn't take and just plays on the queen side, like a3, b4, rook b1, still doesn't take and finally decides to take and then play take, take, and knight a4. Magnus puts the bishop into the middle, Jan plays bishop e3 to trade it off. And then takes, takes, takes a big simplification on the queen side. And we land in this position. Jan did a good job here. He did a really good job nerfing that queen side. Because now the game switches completely over to this side of the board. I mean, there's a position with no CB or A pawns. Have you ever seen that before? One D pawn, right? And now Jan has to not lose. So how does he play a position where he has to not lose? He makes a queen move. Magnus plays knight d7. And Jan plays rook b1, knight b6. Look at that move. Forcing a simplification. Because after this, there's this. Now, even though the knight goes back and this pawn is a weakness, Nepo finds this idea. d4. What's so good about that? Well, if you take, it's not that I'm going to take back. You always need to look for how your opponent can attack you as well. Rook b7. Hitting the queen and the knight. So for that reason, Magnus has to play this move. Now rook b7 anyway, kicks the queen out. And you don't really want to lose like this. So Nepo finds a beautiful idea. Rook back to b3. Look at that. Can't take me because of this. Your queen has to stay guarding the rook. And now I take. And this is the ugliest pawn structure probably in the history of the game of chess, and yet there is nothing you can do about it. They are tripled isolated e-pawns, but Jan is just in time, just in time, to kick that knight out. And that's it. That's all he had to do. He plays queen b2. Magnus tries to instigate a little bit, but Jan just gets that rook trade. King f2. Magnus tries to create a little bit of play with the queen. Look at this. He creates this pawn break later on with g5. Jan just chilling. This is guarded. Pressure here. And Jan finds a cool idea even at the end to take. Get hit with this. And look at this. He takes. He doesn't take like this. It's never too late to lose the endgame. 
Because if you take like this, you get hit with more checks. Your pawns get lost with a check at the same time. Go king f1, queen f4, and then I get you down to this endgame with the h pawn and the safety of my pawns, and you're gonna lose. But Jan finds this move. To blunder, blunder his bishop like this. Like this. But win that last pawn. That's the most important thing. Queen versus queen and knight is unwinnable unless you lose your queen. And Jan, with that in mind, runs the king as far away from the knight as possible. Possible, I just said. Possible. Because this knight could fork you. So he doesn't just fall for the trap of just running the king in close and something. No, he just puts his king all the way over here. Jan doesn't need to win this game. And these pawns aren't going... I mean, I mean, they're not going anywhere if black blockades them. But Jan's not trying to win. He's just trying not to lose. So a lot of checks later and one queen move later. Knight back, queen d7. Look at that. If you take that, you actually lose because I'm going to promote. So Magnus shuffles around. King a2. Draw offered. Draw accepted. And there's nothing to be done. Jan Nepomnici strikes first versus Magnus Carlsen. Now that, you know, it's... It, when Magnus is playing, it's, it, it, it's, it's crazy when things like that happen, right? Just, first of all, Magnus losing any mini-match is... Uh, Oh, wow. So now here's the status going into tomorrow. Magnus has to win the rapid portion tomorrow to force a blitz playoff. If he doesn't win the rapid, there is no blitz playoff. And he still might lose in the blitz. So now the same situation for Wesley. So he has to win the rapid four games. He has to score at least two and a half out of four. And then he has to win the blitz or the Armageddon. So shocking first day. Uh, a T date spoiled for Magnus Carlsen by Yanya Pamici. Um, but there is still hope that we get a, you know, we get a Carlson comeback. Whoever you decide to cheer for, I will see you tomorrow to wrap up the semifinals.